welcome to the Black Artist Program. I'm so happy that y'all are here. My name is Nasha Spade, and I'm a Low Services Librarian. And we have a very special speaker today, and he's going to educate us on Black August, Reconstruction, and the Black Codes. So, um, without any further ado, I welcome Professor Jermaine Jones. Um, a little bit about me. So, um, obviously I'm a writer. As a professor, it depends on if you're at a research university or not, but you have to write. You have to do research and you have to write in your field. So I'm a full-fledged full professor at American University. I teach at Georgetown University, and I teach adjunct classes at Bowie State University. So I'm teaching at three universities. Um, on top of writing and research and all that stuff. So that's probably why you guys never ever see me. <laughs> right? My mom tells me a lot to take a break. I'm like, I can't break, not just yet. Um, I'm saying all these things, obviously, to introduce myself, but guys, I love what I do. I have a passion for what I do. It gives me a platform to give my culture and my race a voice every day, right? Every single day. Um, I teach at the BWY, which is a predominantly white institution, which I, which I love my colleagues. Um, and it's funny because my, in my office at work, my colleague on my left went to Duke University. My colleague on the right went to Stanford or something. And I'm in the middle and I went to NCCU. Yeah. And I wear t-shirts every day. Mm -hmm. Mine is where I went every day, right? But, but it's, it's a good thing. All right, so let's get started. You guys, and maybe you got some sheets. Do you mind how to your sheets for a second? So I want to be clear. I didn't bring you all out just to give you some information go through some slides for you all just to leave and not be able to apply what I'm giving you when you leave um, this room, right? So I ask you guys these questions. As a matter of fact, we can all... Um, what is your breaking point? How do you respond to rejection? Everyone in this room has been rejected. Regardless of who they want to be, we've all been rejected, right? How does your, your environment shape your attitude, right? The way you feel about, the way you, how has your environment shaped your attitude, the way you feel about yourself and others? What does freedom mean to you? That's a good question. It's a very valid question, too. What does success mean to you? And what would you risk to have them all? We're gonna, we're gonna come back to those questions at the end. Um, so, hopefully, you, 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 if you didn't answer the questions, that's fine, but your answers, when we get to the very end of this presentation, your answers, um, will make the information make more sense, all right? All right, so this quote here, on, in my classes, what it is a class I, I teach, but typically my Afro-Red Lit course, I place this quote in the beginning, at the top of the syllabus. Um, and it's a quote by Henry Highland Garnett. And he said, let your model be resistance, right? Resistance, obviously he said it with more feeling, right? Um, he said, no oppressed people have ever secured their liberty without resistance. He also said this, <clears throat> he said, neither gods nor angels or just men command you to suffer for a single moment. Therefore, it is your solid and apparent duty to use every means, both moral, intellectual, and physical, that promises success. Okay. Let me just give you just some brief background on Henry Hopkins on that. So, he was not the typical abolitionist, right? He wasn't like that Frederick Frederick Douglass. He preached kill and survive, right? He was the guy that you give the mic to, he may say something that you can embarrass you, because that's just, that's just how he was, you know, his, his whole perception of freedom, um, it basically, it extended itself beyond just that typical um, mindset. Anyway, I, I love his quotes, um, and this is, this is the same energy I carry to my job, my profession. Anything I do, I, um, I feel as if, um, you know, God gave us the, the means to physical and spiritual means to, to do things you gotta go through the rules, right? All right, these are the same questions I just asked you guys right here. And I wanna be mindful of time too, so. Um, yeah. Same questions, again, we're gonna come back and revisit these questions here. Again, the information we give you guys, listen, I'm not just going through slides just to give you guys this information. I really want you guys to process what, we, what, what I'm about to give you to talk about. Um, even if you're familiar with the reconstruction era or black codes and black laws, um, there still will be some new information. 
for those of you who probably have been exposed to black folks and black laws, 2022 is going to make more sense. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. Um, this is what X said about Black August. Malcolm X said, X said Black August is a month that helps shape our liberation struggle like any other. A month of action, repressive action, and revolutionary action. Wait, February is what month? Black History Month, right? So Black August is the total opposite of that. February, we celebrate folks, king, you know, the typical folks, king and Sarah Louise Keys and Megan Evers and all those guys, right? Black August, we do the opposite. We celebrate the revolutionary the folks who, who you know, felt like it's, it's either, um, you know, death or freedom, right? So that I don't bore you all, rock you to sleep, we're going to cover this in three sections. First section, reconstruction of black folks. Right. Anyone familiar with reconstruction of black folks in class? Does that ring a bell? Yes. Just reconstruction. And I think a little bit of the black code because it's been appearing on Facebook a little bit. Oh, really? I think so. Okay. So, Absolutely, sir. Absolutely. And a lot of stuff popped off, too, in, in that time. A lot of stuff. It wasn't good stuff, for the most part. Um, Black August, I just, I just basically gave it away. That's, that's the month where a lot of the revolutionary acts took place. We'll get to that in a second. Um, and lastly, this is why I say your answers to the questions I asked. Um, listen, a lot of time when I speak, or I hear folks speak, um, and they talk about racism and social injustice. No one talks about the psychological effects of racism and social injustice. The health effects, effects the negative health effects of being subjugated to marginalization. We won't get into that too. I need you guys some information on that, right? And lastly, I'm actually gonna stop uh, maybe 20, 25 minutes before because once I get through this, some of you guys, it's gonna be some stuff you disagree with, with me about, with only it's fine. Either agree but with some stuff, but I wanna hear some of your responses. I wanna have an open discussion with you guys about this QA. Um yeah, so I think that's gonna be good, right? All right, so the gentleman in the back, he really just he just he just he said he said the president, the re reconstruction era. It's that time frame that succeeded or came right after the American Civil War. The American Civil War is basically what? The War of North There you go, right? And um, that was a time frame where, what you guys know, slavery was the money, it was the main source of economic power in the South. So now you got folks who have to relinquish that power, share these jobs with these folks, uh, just think of the January 6th insurrection, those folks, that, that energy, right? not those folks, those they want to mess with folks, but for the most part, that energy, you got to share these jobs with these folks, make room for these folks, and it's a possibility that some of these men may be interested in our women, right, type thing. So anyway, that lasted between 1865 and 1877. But look, this, this information here, I'm going to show you guys and give you um, you see the curse. So 1865, 1877, that's the Reconstruction, that's the Civil War ended, and then we got, now America's trying to figure out what do we do with these black folks, right? Lincoln, and I won't go into detail, some of these things I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go too far into detail. Lincoln was like, I want y'all to wear the hat. It's too much though, can do that. But the perception of black folks during that time, let me give, let me give you an example. So I put this information here, 1874, there were like gang pieces and gang wars and Milton Bradley and companies like uh, McLaughlin Company, who, who um, they uh, they made puzzles and, and books. They they made a puzzle called Chopped Up Niggers. That was the game. The game was called Chopped Up Niggers, mm -hmm. right? And when you put it together, it would be a person of color. Right? Um, there was another advertisement around this time. Um, it was an ink company, Pen Ink Pens, and they actually created this advertising. Um, and they had a, a black baby on the cover, and it said, nigger milk. That was the advertisement, right? These examples are just to give you guys more of a, of, of a vivid image of the rejection that black folks have had to, and the stereotypes that have been asphyxiated to our character, right? Which, in the end, is gonna make perfectly good sense, right? So I wanna say this too. 
I didn't put it on the paper, but rejection, I mentioned the term a while ago, but rejection is a huge feature of black life in America. Rejection, just like a feature. If you purchase a car and you get some leather seats, it's a feature. It's an, it's an additive. Rejection is an additive for black folks in America. It's something we can't escape from the womb. We are rejected. Keep that in mind. All right, so this era redefined U.S. citizenship. War ends. Now America is trying to redefine, I'm sorry, U.S. citizenship. Its primary focus was, was the readmission of the 11 uh, southern states. The young lady just gave us that information, right? So now you have these 11 states that broke away from the Union. Now we have to put them back. We have to rebuild the South. And how do we do that? With all this going on, we still got pushed ahead. The Bible Bill. I'm gonna say something about the black church too, y'all. Might not mm -hmm. like that. I'm say, mm -hmm. I'm gonna say it. Anyway. <laughs> say what's coming. Say what's coming. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> you know what it is. So the primary focus was the rebuild of the South. How do you do that? How do you do that? How do you how do you trust folks who just try to overthrow the government? come in and abide by uh, one set of laws. Um, I've spoken to historians and my, some of the colleagues I work with that teach different courses, and we, we talk about this, this point here, but the rumor is, is that this particular period was sympathetic, was a sympathetic experiment that yielded interracial democracy. I totally agree with that. I don't think any democracy came out of the Reconstruction era. And we go back to the Constitution. Which we, I won't elaborate too much on this, but um, let me ask you guys something. Do you guys feel like the Constitution is a is a is a, uh, a racist document? Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's a business document. Absolutely. America is a corporation anyway, so everything in America is about capitalism, and death is a everything sells in America, right? Everything. Okay. Here's why I say that. Some people say no, some people say yeah. But the thing is this, though. Um, when you talk about folks, someone's intentions, right? Someone can step on your shoe, and their intentions may be not to do it, right? But when you think about the Constitution, when it was penned, the folks who, the folks who, who wrote that, what were their intentions for counterparts? What were their intentions for black folks? The ink on that paper, what were the intentions? That's my, that's my point. Most folks who helped and contributed, they owned slaves. Such a contradiction. <laughs> All right, this is the last point here. Right, the, so these dilemmas, everything we just talked about, right? These were, in fact, divisions of a much broader question. Here's some of the broader questions, right, that we can think about when it comes to the Reconstruction era. The war ends, then we got to figure out how to get these folks back into the mix of things. And once we free these folks, how is that going to look for them? What do we do with them? I told you Lincoln wanted to send them back to Africa. A lot of folks did, but it, it, it was just too much rigor. All right, so what rights were all persons in the U.S. entitled to at that point? And what government entity would guarantee those rights, right? Uh, who's an American citi a citizen, and what are the rights and obligations of a citizen? See, the rules now have changed. Things have been rewritten. We're dealing with the South, y'all. We're dealing with that Bible bill. What is the role of the power of federal government in relation to state and local government? So, change did come in America at the political and national levels. But who was that change for? Who was that change against? We had new laws, and these new laws permanently altered the federal system and the definition of American citizenship. Bill Clinton, 94 crime bill. You guys familiar with that? Mm -hmm. I think you guys see where I'm going with this, too. Mm -hmm. Confederate states. Blueprinted new constitutions. They also acknowledged the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments and pledged their loyalty, loyalty to the U.S. government. 13, 14, and 15, we know this, these amendments can give folks, particularly black men, a chance to vote and stay out of prison. Right? Okay. We have to readmit. These 11 colonies back into the state. We have these free folk, free black folks, and we gotta let them free. How do we protect 
um, they can slay, but well, they're fleeing now. All right. All right. So during this whole period, 13, 14, 15 commandments were created. Let's just talk about it. So 13, what does the 13th commandment say? It says, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment or a crime, right? Uh, where where uh, the party shall uh, have been duly convicted, shall exist. With Basically, there's no slavery unless you got to go to jail. Mm -hmm. Right. Right? Right. Okay. What does 14 say? 14 says, no state shall make or force, enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens in the U.S., nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, property, or property. Um, and we all know black folks are considered property. They granted them the standard and all these things. Right. Without due process of law, no one denied any person with any uh, jurisdiction. Basically, if you are accused of a crime, you'll have due process. Right? Okay. What's 15 say? 15 says the right of citizens in the U.S. to vote should not be denied or abridged by, uh, by the U.S. or any other state. Basically, you have the right to vote. 14, 13, 14, and 15 came into effect. So, absolutely. absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And that's the other thing, too. Women had so hard, historically in America, women really didn't get a look. They didn't get a glance until like 65, 66, 67. But that's for a whole other conversation. That's another conversation. Right? Okay. So we just said the union, Reconstruction was the band aid effect for America. Everyone had to come back together. Let's be friends, type of thing. Okay. Let me go back. 13, 14, and 15 was created around this time to ease the stain for black and slave black folks, right? Okay. Here's where we're about to start linking this period to 2022, 94, 1994, the crime of the stuff like that. Okay? Okay, here we go. That would be all. So here's where we have these systemic issues, vacancy laws, and black code. I think everyone in this room understands if you've been enslaved and you've been set free, what do you own? What properties do you have? What education do you have? Do you have anything substantial enough that you can actually thrive off of? Right? Probably have pieces, bits and pieces of a Bible. Maybe a few you know, clothes, shabby clothes here. Watch this. After the U.S., after the Civil War, state governments that had been a part of the Confederacy tried to limit the voting rights. So now you have these insurrections coming back and saying, hey, you know what? Yeah, we're not with them having any rights. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. The same effort to impose law and order, which became the core of the Southern strategy and also informed the Clinton's uh, administration crime bill. So my point is this. This same ideology just was a direct link to what Bill Clinton and his administration did in 94. The 94 crime bill was what? You guys familiar with that? Yeah. Yeah. Mass incarceration. Three strikes you out. Absolutely. Mass incarceration. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Three strikes you out. Okay. All right. Here's what I'd like to say, too. Now, this lecture, obviously, we, have, we can't get around focusing on racism and social justice. We just can't without talking about the, um, the reconstruction. One thing I don't like to do is create a racist boogeyman where there's no racism. Sometimes we just can't avoid these types of conversations, right? But I'm saying that to say this. Sometimes racism is so concealed that people who are exercising racism don't even know it. It can be systemically, it can be um, through microaggressions at work and things like that. Right? I'm saying that to say, this is the time frame where all these types of examples of racism were exemplified and magnified. All right, Southern states, this last point here. So there were some discriminatory uh, laws that were created, right? Uh, the efforts to enforce white supremacy by legislation. So now, here's the deal, okay. Slavery ends, um, the 13, 14, and 15 come along. So how can we now continuously make money from these group of folks? This was the money machine, right? So 13, 14, and 15 were created. Is it safe to say that's legislation? 
It was great Latin government, right? 13, 14, 15. Okay. I watched this. However, this effort led to a disappointing result in 1896 when the Supreme Court ruled Plessy versus Ferguson. I'm sure you, that rings a bell with you guys. Yeah. That so-called separate but equal uh, facilities thing, right? Okay. From the time until, from that time, Right? 1896, 1895 in that area, until 64, discrimination was actually legal. Now watch this. So, vagrancy laws, after, uh, again, after Reconstruction, basically this is what happened. Laws were just being created just because, okay? So these, initially they were black codes. Before they were laws, they were black codes, right? So the code provided that vagrants could be arrested and in prison uh, at hard labor. So basically, if you were poor, and didn't have an address, you had to go to jail. And that was a way to perpetuate that same system. system. And this was another law that was created by the same government that initiated 13, 14, 15. Okay. And one thing I do suggest you guys do is go behind me, double check, do your own research, right? But the county sheriff could hire black babies to, to, to a white employee to work off the punishment, right? Um, also, the courts customarily waived such punishments for white babies, allowing them to take the over of poverty instead, right? So, so again, pretty much if you were black and you didn't have an address, you looked homeless, you had to go to some sort of farm or camp. Um, the counterparts at that time they could just claim that they, hey, I'm, 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 I fall from hard time, and it is what it is. All right, so to reinforce that and to keep, <clears throat> to keep, you know, these groups of folks together, there was a, a law called an anti-miscegenation law, and these laws basically enforce racial segregation at the level of marriage and intimate relationships. So there was a penalty to pay for black and whites to engage in. So when you look at the bigger picture, what is that? What is that? What does that do? Now you're talking about genealogy. Now you're getting, that's a whole other conversation. And honestly, this law is why I see all these faces of color now, or well, mostly faces of color. This law shapes the faces I'm seeing now. I'll tell you here. Uh, this law equals the human category white in America, and this law was enforced to largely focus on control. And sexuality with white women and non-white men. And if you ask me, this is a whole other conversation too. This is what this is the exact same thing this abortion whole abortion reversing is all about. It's just history of repeating so. Alright, the grandfather clause. Let me talk about vote, right? So the grandfather clause said that a man could only vote if his ancestors had voted before 1867. That wasn't happening for black folk, right? <laughs> Literacy test. They actually gave <laughs> Black folks like the literacy tests. Um, the clerks gave them these tests. Uh, potential voters, these extremely difficult legal documents to read. If they can, if they could read them, they could vote. If they couldn't read them, they couldn't vote. They actually did a jelly bean test. Tell me how many jelly beans in the jar. <laughs> Tell me how many jelly beans in the jar you can vote. This is all factual, right? So, in addition, black folks at the time faced social, commercial, and legal discrimination. Um, so what does that mean? Theaters, hotels, restaurants, all those things were segregated. And in 1937, and we're pushing, we're pushing into uh, 20th century. Um, there was also you guys familiar with the Green Book? The Green Book. Green, the green Book. Green Book. Yeah, they travel to black. Yeah, they travel to states. Yeah, yeah. Black. Black. Hotels, black. black. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. The Negro Motors Green Book. So that had to be created. Basically, it told black folks when they were driving where you could stop and where you, you can't stop. stop. Where well, you can't uh, stay, where you can't stay. stay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, so 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 quickly, I, I mentioned to you, I, I said rejection is a is a is a is a feature of black life, right? So up until 1937, would you say that it's exhausting to be black? It's a lot of heavy lifting. It is. It's tireless, tiring being or existing. Black. Okay. 
Alright, so, so black artists, right? So let's switch gears. We are going to Let's talk about black artists. We just switched out to the point that it's not a set for black history month by any means, right? It's actually the opposite. Um, black artists is a direct result of systemic racism and killings of um, um, black folks. Um, and something about artists, right? This is the month we reflect on and highlight the legacies of black revolutionaries, right? While at the same time, we rededicate ourselves to all the struggles we still have to face. But on the Black August is the month when we celebrate those who have helped us to understand that prison is a political and that our collective freedom uh, depends on abolishing the state's capacity. Anyway, that's, that's, a, that's a type of a prison is a political um, um, harm for the most part. All right, so here we go. So Black August, this is the month we celebrate folks who decided that enough is enough and I'm willing to die for my freedom. It originated in the 70s and actually stemmed from um, the deaths of two brothers, Jonathan and George Jackson, okay, um, and, and a few other black men. So the short version is this. Um, one of their buddies was on trial uh, for the stabbing of a prison guard, and Jonathan actually stormed the courtroom, took some folks hostage. J uh, James McClain was on trial. Yeah, James, uh, James McClain was on trial in 1969. All right. For the stabbing of a guard, I'm sorry, 1969. So he took Judge uh, Harold Haley and he took the DA, Gary Thomas, and um, a few other clerks and things like that. And long story short, um, mostly everyone died. Everyone he, the hostages with the section of two, uh, got killed. He got killed, his brother. His brother got killed a couple years later in prison. Um, but my point is, um, that was part of that whole freedom fight and revolutionary type thing. Okay. All right, now I have here the precursor to all these things, right? Absolutely. 1619. That was a precursor. Okay, this is this event marked the beginning of, uh, of the era of capture. So this 1619 basically exemplified capture, kidnapping, enslavement, and all these things. Now, here, really important here, I wanna I wanna can't highlight it. Um, there were other occurrences of black resistance, right, uh, against systemic racism and state-sanctioned violence, right? So outside of the U.S., the Haitian Revolution, you guys may be familiar with that, 1804. Um, let's, let's come up to speed a little bit. 14, the Ferguson Uprising, Mike Brown being killed. Um, I actually had a chance to sit down with Mike Brown's parents at different times and interview them. And the book that I'm actually writing down, I'm going to throw that interview into the book. Um, some of the things that they, they discussed. Um, the, watch on, the, the March on Washington in 63, uh, I'm sure you guys will be with that too. Um, another occurrence of black uh, resistance, uh, the Watts Rebellion in Los Angeles, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, in 65, what happened was, Mark, uh, my friend Fry, he was arrested, and the police beat him, his brother, and his mom. And that set off a serious riot. And lastly, I think you guys are familiar with Nat Turner, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So Nat, yes. I was just uh, going to say, uh, with the Nat Turner um, uh, rebellion, you had the Seminole rebellions, which were uh, uh, escaped slaves and what they considered at the time Creek Indians, any Indians that were uh, rebellious. Absolutely. They would call them Creek. And they got together during that time, during that turn of time, and um, right. tried to, you know, fight for freedom. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. And to that point, um, what type of mindset do you have, you have to be in order to risk or be ready to die for freedom? What, what kind of mindset do you think you have to be in? Exhausted. Exhausted. Hopeless. It's a lot of heavy lifting being black in America. I say this every time I speak. It's a lot of psychological lifting too. We can get to that in a second. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. All right, Nat Turner. All right, Black August. So basically, Black August is a reminder of the power and unity and, and, and a mandate to continue the, the joint struggle. So all these folks right here um, are, are the folks we celebrate um, Black August. Now, the third section here. Here's where your answers to those questions are going to come into play. Okay. 
actually move and grow out on time too. So I mentioned to you all there's some psychological effects that come along with being rejected and racism and social injustice and being subjected to um, subjected as, as a substandard um, citizen. Um, yeah, yeah. So black identity or identity. Right. So, so everyone in this room has an identity, would you say? I can look at your clothes, I can look at your shoes, and I can, I can tell a little bit about you. They say what you drive and the dogs you have, it, it mimics your identity. I kind of I kind of believe that. <laughs> so how, how do we understand our relationship to the world and in the world and favor our own in-group? So all the, what I'm talking about basically is our identity. Who's your in-group? Who's your social group? Who are the folks you talk to on a daily basis? Do they look like you? Do they dress like you? Do they talk like you? Same accent? Yada, 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 yada. Right? Identity. Also, I say identity lives in your ability to communicate a particular language. Does that make sense? Who makes sense to yourself? All right, black identity is threatened and distorted, right? When we talk about the psychological effects of everything we just talked about, decade, 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 then we have to start talking about our mental health and our emotional health. Right? So what do I mean when I say black identity is, is threatened or distorted, okay? This harms any potential opportunity. So any stereotypes of black men, any typecasting of black men, when we sit down for white validation and we want jobs and we want this, those implicit biases ring loud. We all have implicit biases. But as an adult, we need to do the work to get away from it. We were all men taught certain things about exterior races from our parents and grandparents. And those things may not have been right, but that's what we men taught. And sometimes we stand on those things and we go through life thinking that this group is this or this group is this. All right, you feel that you uh, may not just be good enough for America. I know there's been times where I felt that way. On my journey as a professor at these white universities, I've had so many no's. The good yeses have been good, but there was a time where I started to question my ability to do my job. But it actually had nothing with my ability. It was me searching for white validation. I needed some white folks to tell me I'm good enough to get in there and do it. So you thought? So I thought. So you thought. At that time. Yeah. All right. So I'm saying, I'll come back to that point. Anyway, a dichotomy, a separation amongst black folks is created. I'm talking about all the psychological things, right? So when I say a dichotomy amongst black folks is created, black success is demonized. This is what I mean, okay? I won't elaborate too much, but I do want to touch on what we call the double consciousness and the triple consciousness. You guys may be familiar with that term, double consciousness. W.E. Du Bois and Elaine Locke and all those guys stood on this, right? Which is, in white space, black folks see themselves the same way white folks see them in white space. So you take on their characteristics, you dress like them, you sound like them, you talk like them, they ease the steam of black in the room. And I need to coin this. This is my term, triple consciousness. I do need to coin this. But listen, so, so then there's this thing with triple consciousness where when you are black, you, come, you make it out of a particular environment, you achieve some level of success, now you're on an island because you're too successful to go back to your hood and you're not white enough to be in these white circles. So now you're on this island, this middle class island, upper level class island, and it, and it gets boring after a while. These are all the psychological effects that black folks do. And we say in our Perception of success now is distorted. I was talking to uh, a cousin of mine recently, and um, we were all just, we, we both were just talking about how many folks we know that have been incarcerated. And to a degree, there was a feeling of success having that conversation. Why were we successful talking about folks who were incarcerated? I'll tell you why. Because a lot of times when we come from where we come from, that's all we know. That's those are the most successful people we know. Right? Don't 
I'm gonna get you questions. I wanna, I wanna merge your questions with the long jump. Well, I'm, I'm not gonna hold you guys hostage too much longer. Well, All right, so look, we're still talking about the negative effects, right? The negative effects of everything we just talked about, right? The whole reconstruction era and, and, and type passing and, and stigmas of black people and things like that. All right, so racism and mental health are connected. Do you guys know that? Racism and mental health are connected. So I tell you, they lead to mental health issues that become severe with each experience with people in community, uh, and communities who are targets of racism. And, and pretty much this is what I mean. Um, I know black folks in the South like that pork and eating, eating heavy and greasy and stuff like that. And my mom would uh, definitely try to make me eat beans and all that and stuff. But here's my point. I don't think a lot of my ancestors die from high blood pressure from food and all of these things. I think a lot of the a lot of the health issues came from the trim the trepidation and, and the fear of being subjugated and racism and things like that. Right? Anxiety. And here's what's interesting I found, I came across this a couple of years ago. Even witnessing like subjugation and racism against someone from, from the same community, it can cause like a vicarious trauma or cause PTSD, even if you're not the direct uh, target of that particular type of racism. Alright? Also, racism is associated with higher power rates of stress, increasing a person's co uh, a color, person of color's risk of developing high blood pressure. Listen, this is from the CDC, but it's not Professor Jones, Jamaica Jones. This, this is research information. Right? Um, so think about this. Think about how, you know, how older family members and high blood pressure and all these other things. And um, you know, we're thinking this. Bad eating habits. Symptomatic racism. Right. So again, racism is associated with high rates of stress and high blood pressure. All right, here's another study. Right? Um, this study found that the unfair treatment of people of color has a significant effect on their sleep and their psychological function mid-life. So then you're talking about moving to 35, 40 years old, and you have these issues of sleeping and these health issues, and you think they're coming from, oh, I'm just aging, but they're coming from the trepidations of being subjugated again. Right. While individuals of all racial, ethnic, minority groups, everybody, right, of color, but for the most part, are at risk of experience racial discrimination, it's something about black Americans, though, when it comes to racism. It's something about us. Mm. It just hits different, right? Um, yeah. All right, so I think we're almost done, y'all. All right, so I just want to re re reiterate what I said. So rejection becomes a permanent aspect of black life. Um, there's this book. If you guys get a chance to read this book, um, her name is Whitney Cooper. She wrote this book called Elephant, Elephant Rage. Um, we have a lot in common. Um, she, we're about the same age. She's a professor in New Jersey Rutgers. Um, she's from the South, right? She's from uh, Louisiana. And actually, I interviewed Brittany. Um, it may be online somewhere. I had a, had a chance to interview her um, back in 2021. Again, the book is called Elephant Rage. And this is what she says in the book, and this is, what she, this is what she told me. She said, I wrote this book from the, from the viewpoint of a, this is what she says now. She says, I wrote this book from the viewpoint of a fat black woman and how I changed the bandwidth, the frequency of white space when I entered into white space. She goes on to say, she says, she says she just reiterates some of the stuff she wrote in the book. She says this in the book too. She says, I blame Bill Clinton for not being able to have a um, equal mate because of the 94 crime bill. Um, it made it so there were there were not too many available and qualified black men to marry. I'm referencing her because um, 
she shares some things with me that were kind of personal about her mental health as a professor. She's a young professor too. She's not she's not old at all. But some of the things she saw her mother go through with men and how um, her being um, a black female professor at these PWIs, these predominantly white institute, institutions, how that form of uh, microaggression affects her mental health. And I had to agree because um, when I go to meetings at work, it's like 85 people just in my department. So when we have these huge meetings at work, subconsciously, when I go in, when I when I go through the door, I'm automatically looking for the black folks. Who y'all is on the city shop? But why am I doing it? I'm in condition to look for my safety net, my safety box. That's part of the whole complicit bias and microaggression. Right? Because biases are powerful. Anyway, she blamed Bill Clinton for not being able to find a, a, a decent man. And at first I was like, whatever. But then when she started breaking it down, if you read the book, she made perfectly good sense. Right? All right, let me keep going. All right, so the negative effects of racial trauma affects physical health outcomes. These symptoms. The symptoms are often inflamed by the common lack of access to adequate adequate uh, medical service. That's a whole nother discussion, right? I like to say, um, your zip code determines the quality of health care you get. What about you possibly you get? Your zip code determines the quality of education you get. True. All right, so let's talk about some long-term psychological effects of racism, right? Physical pain, Right, more likely to experience chronic stress, depression, anxiety, PTSD, hypertension, um, cardiovascular issues, respiratory issues, high blood pressure. Um, personal, emotional, and emotional impediments, right? This personal issue. Um, relationship difficulties, problems with belonging at work, uh, carry a reduced self well being. All these things have been researched. Right. Increased anxiety in white space. Um, example, white dominated war rooms, conference rooms, management meetings, faculty and staff meetings. If you enter a room that's predominantly white space, how do you, how do you guys typically feel? Are you nervous? Mm -hmm. yeah. no, I'm not. 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 I'm but it depends on where you came from. What? You know, my dad was military, you know, with ECU, you know, so I came up military, came through it, so right. there was always people, so. Absolutely. But Thank that means more hate. Absolutely. It depends on your experiences, right? And it depends on your hate. Hate. more hate. Right. Mm -hmm. And boy, now you see yourself too. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> In addition to everything you guys just said, the black experience is not the same. Now the obstacles are monolithic, they're the same. The obstacles we all face, but the black experience is not the same. Okay. Meaning, what's the vehicle that takes us to white space? What's the vehicle that, that, that shifted us to a middle class lifestyle? Athletics will take someone from inner city poverty to white space. Entertainment. Entertainment okay. will take you to white space. Education. Education, Education. Education. Right. So if you don't hop on those three chain, trains to go to white space, what you gonna do? Black home. And the folks who do catch that train, what do the folks back home think about them? Oh, no. <laughs> oh, you too, you too oh, yeah. good now. You think you're there. Right. Right. Yes, Lord. But the goal was to elevate. But the goal was to elevate, right. That's why I say the black experience is not the same. Mm -hmm. The folks who catch the train, something happened, something snapped, mentor, something happened. So mom and daddy go through something. Then when you get to that middle class, I just mentioned this. You're too black to go to these white spaces, to get in these boardroom meetings. So you're stuck. No visitation. It's just you. All right, let me get through this. All right. Um, increased anxiety in white space, white dominated. So that's boardrooms, work meetings, things like that. And lastly, I have here. Even when institutions do successfully employ people of color, right? So when we do get a foot in the door, 
Uh, we still got to worry about implicit bias. We still have to worry about racial aggression um, that um, that comes when we try too hard to fit in into these spaces, right? Last thing, uh, so we're still dealing with heightened stress. Um, I mentioned the double consciousness. That's just when we, as black folks, when you see yourself through the eyes of white people, you actually, and, 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 and honestly, I think that's part of a, a lot of us don't like ourselves. We, we do, we dislike ourselves. We've been conditioned to believe that we just not give good enough for particular spaces, right? But we all know that's a whole other conversation, but like that's when we can, you know, you start to self destruct. All right, see yourself through the lens of your counterparts while, um, uh, while in the company of white folks, right? You take on, you see yourself the same way they see you. Well, individually. All right, so the idea of being in America, what does that mean? The idea of being an American, while at the same time not being an American, it diminishes one's self-worth and you morally collapse, right? There's this term called that allostatic load. What that means is a person of color is given the bulk of the work or more, more duties at work and they don't even know it's clandestinely done, it's secretly this is a direct result of being distributed a disproportionate workload, right? Compared to your white counterparts. Mm -hmm. All right, last thing I want to point out here. Um, I say rejection becomes a permanent aspect of black life in America, right? At a very early age, we learn more about our identity but we understand at a very early, a very early age um, that we are rejected in certain spaces. Um, you guys familiar with the baby dog test, I'm sure. Right? Yeah. The baby dog test in the 60s mm -hmm. and 70s, and so Dan O'Brien did it back in the 2000s, where babies are shown these dogs, and the darker the dog, the leaner the baby is. How does that happen, right? Well, we know how it happens, but. Um, and I also say the marginalization they experience in school, society, and white workspaces is an extension of slavery, the legacy of slavery. So this is something I love to end with. So any type of marginalization, any kind of racism that we may experience now, is just an extension of the legacy of slavery. Bottom line, you can call it how you want to call it, cut it, slice it, and dice it, but it is. That's it? Any questions?